So where we left off, we had the idea of searching through an array with a loop. So you just have a search value, a target value, you use a loop to iterate through each value in the array, and then when you find the value that you want, boom, you do something with it. You either save its index value, so you can use that index value later, or you print it out, or whatever you were supposed to do with it once you found it. And that's a sequential search. And then it hit the idea of a parallel array. That's a second array to hold corresponding data. When you have two arrays of the same length, where the elements are linked by their index, that is a parallel array. And let me check my notes, but I think we already hit that idea. Yep. So, two or more arrays of the same length. So, for example, we created an array with the days of the week and then we created another array of the same length so that we could keep track of the temperature on Monday, the temperature on Tuesday, the temperature on Wednesday, the temperature on Thursday, and the temperature on Friday. Yeah. Other silly examples would be a, a, an array of first names, an array of last names, and an array of their, those people's favorite colors, right? We would have three arrays of the same length, one called you know, first names, one called last names, and one called colors. And if we wanted to, we could print them all out. So, improving a loop's efficiency. When you are searching for an array, excuse me, when you're iterating through an array and you only want to do something with one value, once you find it, you can break out of it. Change x to force break out of loop when you find a match. Oh, for Pete's sake, that's a stupid way of doing it. Don't do that, guys. There's a break keyword in the language. That is a far better way of breaking out of a loop than setting x to another value. Okay, if you want to do it that way, there's nothing wrong with it. But I would replace this statement, x is equal to valid value dot length, to just break. What this is doing is it's pushing x past the, uh, the end of the loop, you know, I mean, to a value where the test condition is no longer true. But why not just use a break, right? Anyways, so you're searching through the array. When you find the one you want, you do something with it, and then you break out of the loop. See, they even used the word break there, but they didn't use the word break there. So you can use a while loop to search for an array. You set the subscript to zero, and while the item is being searched for is not equal to a value in the array, you keep increasing the subscript. And you search only while the subscript remains lower than the number of elements in the array. Searching an array for a range match. Determine the pair of limiting values between which a value falls. Total quantity ordered 1 to 12, 13 to 49, 50 to 99, 100 to 199, or 201. What they have done here is they set up an array of the lower values. At 1 to 12, they set it equal. 13, because 13 being 1 past 1. 13 to 49, they set it equal to 50. 50 to 99, because that's set to 100. And then, you know, 200 or more, that's the last limit there. And then they have discounts appropriately, right? So if you've sold less than 1, then you don't get any discounts. If you sold less than 13, you get a 10% discount. If you sold less than 50, you get a 14, whatever. If you sell less than 100, you get an 18% discount. If you sell less than 200, you get a 20. And then, so we count through the subscripts. We count through the items. And if the number of the items ordered is less than the discount ranger's lower limits, then we lower the index number. And then once we find its position, in there, then we set that discount appropriately. Now you can go ahead and look at that carefully. I'm not going to lecture much more about that. If you took fundamentals recently, they show something very similar to this in the uh, chapter about arrays, where you had you know list of values, and then you were calculating some kind of discount or bonus based on whether it fell between those ranges of values. 
using binary search, sort, and reverse methods. The system.array class contains a variety of useful built-in tasty methods that can search, sort, and manipulate an array. And here's what it looks like. It's not, see, we create an array called ID numbers here. And then when we want to search it, we pass in that array into something called array.binary search. So array is a separate class from your own array, right? It's a helper class. Java has the same idea. There's a helper class called arrays, which you can use to manipulate arrays in Java. Well, system.array in C Sharp lets you manipulate arrays. And I would like to play with this a little bit. What we're going to do is I'm just going to create a little simple array, and then I'm going to type in array dot and see what kind of methods pop up, what kind of choices we have to manipulate arrays in that fashion. Uh -huh. Find new project. Console app, C sharp. That's correct. This is lecture M. So I'm going to make an array of numbers. That's the easiest thing to do, right? Int nums equals you know, 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. Don't we have that var keyword? Is it possible to create an array of type var? Nah, didn't think so. the compiler, hey, you pick a type for this array. All right, so we have a cute little array there. Now I'm going to type arrays dot. Nope, I didn't do it. Array dot. And here's a list of methods for it. Copy. We could copy the array. Constrained copy. I don't know what that is. Copies a range of elements from one to another starting at the specific sort index. So you could limit the range that you're copying. You have an array that's 10,000 elements long, but you only need the middle 100 items. Then by using that one, you can do that. How about equals? If you want to compare two arrays, you can use dot equals. That's nice, because otherwise you'd have to write a loop yourself to compare every element. There's something called find index. Searches for an element that matches the conditions. Find last. Just plain old find. And then there will be one called sort. Sort's a nice one. And then there's reverse. Okay, so say I was curious about what the lowest number is in this is and what the maximum number is. Uh, we could write a loop that would look for the lowest number. We could write a loop that would look for the largest number. Those are all very valid exercises. But there's also a cheaty way you could do it. Is you could just sort it, right? And if you sort it, then the first element is going to be the lowest, and the last element is going to be the highest. What if we do that? What if we try that? Array dot sort parentheses nums. And then let's print the array out with a little loop. For each parentheses int v in nums. I like v for value. It's a for each loop. Whatever. That variable could be anything you want. Console dot write parentheses v plus a space. And then after the loop, let's console dot write line. Just to go to the next line. this, you know what, we ought to make this a function so that we can print our array anytime we want to. I'm going to cut that code. I'm going to come up here under our class, and I'm going to add a new method. Static void 
print nums. And it's going to take an array of objects. Int. I'm just going to give it the same name so that I don't have to change my code. Int, square brace, in brace, nums. I'm going to put my pair of curly braces there and I'm going to paste. And okay, that time, every time I want to call my array, excuse me, every time I want to print my array, I can just use that function. So, print nums. That's an annoying message. This method has zero references. Well, of course it has zero references. It's the main method. It's not going to be called by any part of our code. All right. Anyways, I'm going to run it. And it closed, of course, because I didn't put my console.read down here at the bottom. Console.read. And yeah, there are some system settings you could change that would fix that. And if you start it, perhaps, in non-debug mode, sometimes it doesn't close the window. But anyways. There we go. All right, and so now they are sorted, right? So the minimum is real easy to find, isn't it? It's just the first element in the array. And the maximum is also real easy to find. It's the last element in the array. But we have ruined the order here, right? This is our new array. And what if the order was very specific? Like what, what if it was part of a parallel array, you know, the seven days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Well... If these numbers were supposed to correspond with certain weekdays, then sorting this data would be really bad because it would break the links between your parallel array of day names and this. So that's not so great for what I'm suggesting here for finding the first and the last values. But what if we made a copy of it? This could be our original array, and then we could sort a copy of it. Well, let's see about an array.copy method. So, array.copy, parentheses, if we have to give it a source array, nums, we have to give it a destination array, well, I haven't even made a destination array, so I guess I better go and make one. For now, I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to create another array of the same length. Int, dumbs copy, equals new int, and I need the length of the original array inside my square braces because that's how many elements I need. So nums.length. That was supposed to be a capital L. Nums.capital length. Seems to be a method called get length. I wonder what the difference between calling get length and using the dot length property is. Okay, so now we have a copy. It's, excuse me, now we have a new array. It's empty, right? All the elements are zero. We could copy the elements in one by one with a little loop like this for int i equals zero, i is less than nums dot length, i plus plus, and then inside our body, we just do nums copy subscript i is equal to nums subscript i. Now that made it, that copied the stuff into our new array. But we also could have used the array.copy method to do the same thing. And if an API gives you a method, you know, it's usually better to rely on it than rewrite our own code. So I'm going to change this array dot sort nums. I don't want to sort the original data anymore. I want to sort the copy. So how about nums copy? And then let's print out nums copy. All right. So that seemed to work. But like I said, if there is a method available to us, to do the copy for us, we may as well use it. I, I want y'all the happy idea of using loops to do copies of arrays. But array.copy, here's our source array. It's called nums. 
Here's our target array. It's called nums copy. And if you want to, you could specify a link that you wanted to copy out to. I believe that if we leave the length off, then it defaults to copying the entire array. Oh, and I would be so wrong. You have to specify the length of the array. That's too bad. All right, so nums.link. I'm regretting not like setting that as a variable somewhere. There's got to be a, a clone method or something that'll create a brand new copy of the array without having to do that. So, I'm going to type array. Dot. Nope, that doesn't work. All right, I'm really puzzled. Sorry about that, guys. I thought... All right, so this is a way to create a copy, a brand new copy of the array that is the identical to the original. All I did is I, you know, cut my line that said array. Dot copy and pasted it right there where the variable is declared. So nums copy at this point is what's known as a clone of the original array. Well, there's an easier way to do that, fortunately. So I'm going to comment those two things out. And I'm going to do this. Int square braces nums copy equals nums.clone. Parentheses in parentheses. I'm getting an error. Pretty missing a cast. cast it to the type. All right. It's not cast to the correct type. Well, we can fix that. Please make this an array of ints. All right. So whether you use the dot clone method, which is actually part of the thing that arrays give you, or if you use array dot copy to create it, either way is fine. It still gives you a copy of it. To my eyes, it, once I finally remembered what it looked like, Doing this is easier than doing these two things, right? Making it and then copying it like that. This, this does it in one fell swoop. But what else, right? I want you to know how to make an array of the same length as another one. So that is a very good line of code. And I want you to know how to copy from one array to another one. So that's also a good line of code. But if you're going to clone your array, you could just do that. So let's find out what the maximum and the minimum numbers are. All I'm going to do is do int max equals, and it's going to be the element at the end of the array. And so if the array is 10 long, it's going to be index 9. And I'm really getting tired of typing nums.length and stuff like that, but I'm going to go with it. Is there a last? There, there can't possibly be a, a uh, nums copy dot. No, 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 we're not going to try that. Okay, so anyways, int max is equal to nums copy at, and we need the uh, index of the last value, which is the length minus 1. So nums copy dot length minus 1, right? Because if it's 10 items long, then the maximum index is 9. The minimum is really easy to find, right? It's just the element at index 0. Maybe you can see now why the uh, folks who invented Python did that thing where they said if you do index minus 1, it takes you to the end of the array. You can see why, you know, they, maybe they came up with that. But anyways, this one doesn't do that. Oh, anyways, and then the int min is equal to nums copy at index 0. And we can print that out if we care. So now that our data is sorted, we could check to see if a value can be found in it using a binary search. And I've already mentioned a binary search in the last lecture. A binary search relies on the idea that the data is sorted. Let's go ahead and run this. So the data is sorted like this. So if you're looking for a 4, it's real easy to determine whether it's there or not, right? First it goes in the middle. I'm looking for a 4. Well, no, I didn't find there. You better go smaller. 
Okay, so it comes down here. All right, nope, you better try one more. Nope, all right, didn't find it at all. It's not in the list. So it really only took it about three checks to see if it was in the list, whereas with a binary search, it would have to iterate through all seven items to find it. Excuse me, with a sequential search, it would take all seven. But a binary search would take only three, you know, in order to rule it out, maybe four to maximum. So we have a binary search method available to us. Array dot deny binary search. Is there also one that's attached just to the array itself? Nums copy dot. Nope. All right. So let's say that I'm looking for the number seven. I just want to find out whether seven is in the array or not. Maybe I'm going to replace it with a zero or something. I don't know why. But I want to find out whether seven is. So I'm going to do a variable to hold that. I'm going to call it target. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm going to create a variable called found at, which is going to be the index position if it ever does find it. So found at is equal to arrays dot, whoops, excuse me, array dot binary search parentheses and, and we're cert and the only array that we have that is sorted is one called nums copy so nums copy goes there and then our target that will return us the index value of that digit of that place so let's print a little message indicating that we found it or not so CW Tab tab expands out to console dot right line, and so I'm just going to print a little message using a placeholder. Placeholder zero was found at placeholder one. In quote comma target comma found at. So seven was found at position four. Zero, one, two, three, four. What if we look for a number that's not in there? My guess is it's going to return a two. I mean, excuse me, a negative one. I'm going to look for a two and see if it returns a negative one. Something nagging at me about that and may return a slightly different value, but it's going to be negative. So search my array for two. Well, I know that there's not one. Anyways, okay, I was right. It returns a negative number. Now, a lot of search routines will return a negative value, uh, just a negative one, indicating that it didn't find it. But C Sharp tries to be a little bit more clever. They tell you the index number of the last one that was checked on its way out. So in this case, it compared it to five, and that was the last one it checked. That doesn't sound right, but uh, let's, let's look for another number like 10. That's going to be off at the other edge of the loop. So I'm going to change my target to 10. And then I'm actually going to look up the documentation for binary search so I can tell you exactly why it's returning it is. Okay, so 10 was found at negative 8. It's returning the position where it would be if it was in the array. Is there another value we can search for that would illustrate it? There's no 4s in here, so let's look for a 4. change it. Four. And it's saying that if there had been a four, it would be an index value three, right? Index value zero, one, or it would be two. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so we're going to go and look, we're going to look at the documentation of it because I'm not quite getting it. should have looked to begin with. All right, all they're doing here is they're checking to see if it's less than zero. If it didn't find it, it's less than zero. I really would like a better explanation of what it is returning.
So if the value is not found and the value is less than one or more of the elements in the array, the negative number returned is the bitwise complement of the index of the first element that is larger than the value. If you feel like figuring out exactly what it's doing, that's fine. What I was telling you was kind of close to the truth, but not exactly the truth. But you can use that position to figure out where it would be in the list, you know, what uh, the, the nearest closest value. In general, I just go, what? Whoop, it's negative. I didn't find it. So their little code example here. We have a list of numbers. We ask them to enter an employee ID. Then we search the array. And if the value returned as less than zero, we print, nope, not found. Else we go ahead and print that we found it. All right. So I want to play with the idea of parallel arrays a little bit, and then we'll get back into the idea of doing a search but maybe not a binary search because I'm not sure how we would do a binary search on the kind of data that I want to cook up. So is there just a plain and simple search that's part of the array itself? And I believe there is. If I did this, yeah, change is not allowed while it's not running. If I type in, come on, nums dot, nope, that didn't work. So there's no method for doing a sequential search. We can always write our own. Yep, and here's an implementation of a sequential search algorithm. All right, well, we'll write our own then. But here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create, you know, an another, another array, like, a, you know, months or days or something like that, and then have some corresponding values to those. Instead, I think I'm going to do names and, you know, ages. And then I'm going to look to see if any of that, per, or names and IDs. And if we ask for a specific ID and we find it, we're going to print their name. So let's do names, string names. And I'm just going to create an array of four names. Jill, Sarah, Bob, Jim. Why is it underlining Jill? Because I put the braces in the wrong place. I did this as a, a Java array. It is not. It's a C-sharp array. I need to move those curly brace, the uh, square braces there. All right, so we have an, a, an array of names, and now let's make an array of ID numbers. Int IDs equals, and I'm going to, you know, just provide four ID numbers, but I'm going to make them real small rather than, you know, like 3099251 or whatever. So we're going to say that Jill is in employee number two. Sarah's employee number five, this is a very false small company. Bob is employee number 10, and Jim is employee number four. And not guaranteed that this stuff is in order. So that would not be a good thing. Yeah. If those IDs were in order, then yeah, we could do a binary search on them. What I want to do is that since these are not in order, I want to be able to search the IDs to find out if a specific ID exists. And if it does, I know that. If it doesn't, then I know that as well. So the simplest way to do it, and this is very similar to what we did last time, is to have a variable that indicates the index at which the position is found at. And if that variable is set to negative 1, we know we didn't find it. If it's set to a value greater than 0, then we know we did find it. And I think I already had one called found at already up here. So I'm going to re I'm going to reuse that found at equals negative one, and then let's get a target. We could ask the, ask them for a target. Instead, I'm just going to hard code a target. Int. Wait, we already have the word target as well. 
So target is equal to 10. I want to know which employee is, is 10. So we should prompt for this, right? So now we need a loop. We need to find the position of it inside the IDs, and once we find that, we know that the corresponding position in the names array is the name that matches that specific person. So, for int i is equal to zero, i is less than the length of the array, so ids.length, ids.l length, plus plus i. So if IDS subscript I equals equals target, then we have found it. Then found at equals I, and then break. We don't want to keep searching that list anymore. zero, we didn't find it. So we're going to print an error message. CW, tab tab, console.write line, placeholder zero. Or I guess we could put the word ID space, placeholder zero, not found. In quote, comma, target, because we weren't able to find it. Else, we're going to print something, we're going to print the person's name. Else, I feel like kind of storing it in a, in a temporary variable of some kind. So string s is equal to names subscript found at, and then I could print that, their name out. Console.write line. is placeholder zero equals name placeholder one end quote comma and so the ID was our target and then our name is a string and you know what? I think I'm going to redo my decision. I'm going to delete that string S bit, and I'm going to pull the ID out directly from the IDs array. IDs subscript found at end brace comma names found at. Why obscure the relationship between the two with temporary variables? So if I come back up here and look, my arrays, and I'm going to do just a little bit of a rearranging of the code to get more of the code on the same screen. I kind of decided I like doing this, if it'll let me. You never know how big, um, when this Visual Studio editor is going to reformat things for you. Makes it a little bit easier to read, harder to read, but at least it's got a lot of stuff on the screen. Okay, anyways. So, we do have those IDs, and person number 10 is indeed Bob, right? Corresponds to Bob. So, when we run this, hopefully it will say that ID 10 is Bob. And lo and behold, ID 10 is equal to the name Bob. Maybe I'm going to take out the word name here. Didn't like the way that looked. 
All right, so I'm going to change it to an ID that doesn't exist. Well, first of all, let's change it to another one. Let's look for employee ID 5. And ID 5 is equal to Sarah. If we had to do a lot of binary searching, excuse me, I keep saying that. If we had to do a lot of sequential searching, it'd be a good idea to go ahead and write this up as our own method, right? We shouldn't have to write a for loop every single time we want to do a, a, a sequential search on something. So we could write a, a method that accepted an array, accepted a target value, and returned you know, a value of the index or negative one if not found. So I suggest we go ahead and do that. I think, yeah, let's do that. So I'm going to come up here, and above my print nums method, I'm going to make another method. Static, it's going to return an int, which is the index, and I'm going to call it sequent underscore search. Give it some name you like. And what does it take? It takes a target, and it takes an array of integer. So I'm just going to do int square braces IA for integer array, or AI for array of integers, something like that. Or AR for array, who cares? Now it's going to do the same thing as the other bit. We have to have a variable which holds the index. It's not liking my name here. Oh, well, that's because I don't have a return yet. Okay, so I need a variable to hold. I'm just going to call it found at again. This thing returns a negative one if it doesn't find it. And we're going to use another for loop. For int i is equal to zero, or x equals zero, whatever. x is less than the length of the array, so ar dot capital L length. x plus 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 x. If, you know what, we're not going to even need that found that variable. Yeah, I guess we, I guess we'd better. Not if we write this with two different return statements. I'm going to make this code look exactly the way the other did. So I am going to leave it. And I just changed my mind on it. I'm not. What I'm going to do is my, if my if statement finds it, it's going to return that value immediately. So if ar subscript x in brace equals equals target, great. Return x. We found it. And then down here, after the for loop, if we get to this point, it means we never found it. So we just return a negative 1. So that is a sequential search written to accept integers. We could write another one that would accept strings and another one that would accept arrays of doubles or whatever. But this is good enough. We don't need to uh, you know, generate more code than necessary just to solve a specific problem. So then I'm going to go down and modify my code to actually call this method rather than use that, that search that we had. So scroll back down, scroll back down, scroll back down. Here's my found that stuff. Here's my loop. I'm going to comment all that out. It's good code, but... Here's what I'm going to do. Found at equals sequent underscore search, or whatever you called your function, the target, and the name of the array, which is IDS. I've never tested this with a ID that wasn't found, so I'm going to change the target ID to, you know, one. That's not in there. All right, an ID one was not found. So if it had been possible to guarantee 
that our list of IDs was sorted, that'd be great. We could use binary search and it would be a lot faster. Unfortunately, the way I set the data up, it was not sorted. And if we did sort it, it would break the connection of the parallel array by index values. So there's one little more use of the sequential search method that I want to demonstrate. What if we also had an array of like states that each person lives in? But I don't feel like writing a new one to search strings, so instead I'm going to use ages. So int curly brace ages is equal to, and I'm just going to give you know each one of these people you know an age, but I'm going to give several of them you know. I want two matching values in here. So I gave two of them the age of 30. And I want to write a routine that will print a list of all the names for a specific age. Right? If I look for age 31, it's going to print Sarah. But if I look for age 30, then it's going to print Jill, but not Sarah, and then Bob. Not kind of thinking that uh, the sequential search method that we wrote is not up to this task because it would only find the first person of age of 30. It would not find all the people with age of 30. So instead, we're just going wind to up, wind up writing a loop that checks every value here. And if we ever do find an age that matches, then we're going to print it out, but we're going to keep going because we want to print out everybody of that age. Let's just do that right here. Let's declare a variable called target age. Target age equals 30. I want to print out everybody who has an age of 30. And then I'm going to use another for and i equals 0, i is less than, you know, kind of loop. Or Zero, I is less than the length of the array, so ages dot capital L length plus plus I. All righty, and now let's check to see if that age is found. If Ages subscript i equals our target age. Then we're going to print that name out. Or we could even print out, you know, the entire piece of information. But printing their name out is enough, huh? So. Console dot right line. Parentheses quote name equals placeholder zero ID equals placeholder one age equals placeholder two and then after the ending quote I'm going to put comma and I'm going to list out my variables so on the next line I'm putting it all on the next line. Names, subscript I, comma, IDS, subscript I, comma, ages, subscript I. Now, if it doesn't find a match at all, it's just not going to print anything, right? So perhaps we should do a binary search just to validate that that name even exists. Excuse me, that that age even exists so that we can print an error message. But this will do. Uh, this will at least prove the point. For, so for 30, I'm expecting to see two names come up. I'm expecting to see Jill and Bob. Yep. Jill, age 30, and Bob has 30. And if we type in a name, a age that doesn't exist, like if we set the target age equal to 15, that doesn't exist. It's not going to print either one of these records. 
do that? Do we want to rule out that case? Here's what it would take, some kind of if, right? So if sequential, sequence search, parentheses, target underscore, excuse me, target age, comma, ages, is less than zero. Now apparently I have lots of typos in here. If sequence search target age, I have too many closed parentheses there. There we go. That's what it's supposed to look like. If paren sequence underscore search parentheses target age comma ages in parentheses less than zero. Because that's the error condition, right? If we do the search and we don't find it, then we didn't find it. Console dot right line. Nobody matches age. Placeholder zero in placeholder in quote comma target age. I'm gonna hit enter on that so it goes on the next line for the usual reasons. I wish I could stretch this out. And then you need an else here, right? Else. And it would be nice if the else blocked everything off, right? We really want all of this stuff to be shifted over by one. Honestly, it would actually work if we didn't do what I'm about to do. But why not? Put a brace there. Put that brace. Shift the entire for loop over. And there we go. Okay. So we've played with parallel arrays. We've shown writing our own sequential search method. We've shown sorting an array in order to get the minimum and the max. And there are certainly other ways of doing that, of course. You can write a loop that'll search for the minimum value and then a, a loop that'll search for the maximum value. All right, so that was like only two pages of the PowerPoint here. So the sort method arranges the items in ascending order. We've already shown this. You use array.sort and you feed it the array that you want to sort. And once it is sorted, you can do the binary search. The reverse method, it just flips the order of it. So remember our nums copy array that we sorted? We could reverse it, but then binary search wouldn't work on it anymore. So that'd be a bad idea. But what if we wanted to print out our names array in uh, sorted order, in reverse sorted order? Let's go ahead and do that. This, I'm just going to scroll way down to the bottom of our code right before the, the uh, console read key thing. And I just want to print this array reversed. Print the names array reversed. But I'm going to make a copy of it because I don't want to mess up our original data. So string square braces names copy equals names dot clone capital C. And I forgot to give it a type. So before names.clone, I'm going to put parentheses, string, square braces. Parentheses, string, open square, close square, in parentheses. Then I can reverse it. But why don't we print it like that, and then let's print it the reverse. We never wrote a method that would print out a list of names. We wrote one that would print out strings, I believe. Excuse me, numbers, I believe. Print nums. Okay, so we'll do it old school, but it won't take long. For each string s in names copy. Console dot write s followed by a space. And then let's write a blank line. Console dot write line. And now let's call names.sort and print it out, and then let's call names.reverse and print it out. So we're going to wind up doing these 
lines two more times. So I'm going to make a copy of them. So array dot sort parentheses names copy. Print that stuff out. Just paste this line printing stuff. And then array dot reverse names copy. Print them out again. So the original array was Jill, Sarah, Bob, Jim that wasn't sorted. And then Bob, Jill, Jim, Sarah, and then Sarah, Jim, Jill, Bob, right? So we have the ability to sort things. We have the ability to reverse the array. Mexicota did all of these. I left the original data untouched just in case we needed to keep its original order, which we would if we were going to do more work with that IDs array or the you know, pages. So multi-dimensional arrays. I'm just about really ready to stop here. And it's worth talking about arrays for a good long time. But on the other hand, hopefully you've had exposure to them in other classes. But there's at least one more lecture I want to give on arrays. But we know enough to at least do the homework assignment that's coming up regarding this topic. So what are we going to do? We're going to write a console application that does the following. Ask the user to input rainfall for 12 months, January to December. That kind of implies that you're going to run parallel arrays. One for rainfall and then one with a, a month names. right? So you're going to have an array of strings, that's 12, and then you're going to have an array of numbers. Making doubles. Check the input for validity. Decide for yourself what makes the input numbers invalid. For example, there's no such thing as a negative rainfall. And then store, the, and if that's the only check that you want to put in there, that'd be okay, but maybe you can decide a maximum would be too large, right? That nobody will ever have more than 10,000 inches of rain in a month, right? You could rule that out too if you wanted to. And then store the values in an array of doubles. So, one, use a loop to calculate the average rainfall. Then copy the array into a new array called sorted rain. Sort that array, and then display the highest and the lowest rainfall elements. It'd be even niftier if you printed the month, but I don't ask for that, as well as the average. And then now that you have the values of the minimum and maximum rainfall, you should be able to print which month each occurred. Oh, well, there you go. So that's just like the age, right? I was searching for target age 30. It went through the age, and then every time it found one, it printed out the name of the corresponding. So in this case, you would be searching your rainfall for that minimum, and whenever you found the minimum, you would print it out from the name of the month's array. And then lastly, display a bar graph of the rainfall. A what? Well, it doesn't have to be real complicated. Here we go. Assuming that our data look like this, 12, 9, 3, 24, 0, 25, 0, 2. What I did is I just displayed an asterisk for each inch of rain for that month. And then I had this little meter here up at the top, and I kind of goofed on the meter because it really should say 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, rather than 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? But even if you left that legend off completely, you know, if you just print one asterisk, per, you know, so for December we had 10, so there's 10 asterisks. For September we had 2, so there's 2 asterisks. That's what I mean by bar graph. You can do, you can start trying to get really fancy with bar graphs, right? Like you could calculate a maximum width, and you could try to scale into this. No, you don't have to do that. So this is pretty much what I want the output to look like. You ask the user for rainfall for each one of these, and if they give you an invalid value, don't let them do that. Make them type it again. And then we print a table, 
then we tell them the average monthly rainfall, we tell them the minimum, we tell them the maximum, and then we tell them the months with the minimum rainfall were May and August, the months with the maximum rainfall were April, and then our cute little bar graph. All right, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, gang. We will do at least one more lecture on arrays. I'm not planning on doing more than one more lecture on arrays, though. I'm eager to get on to more object-oriented programming stuff because you already have exposure to arrays and stuff like that in other classes, but maybe not so much object.